Hi, my name is Jamie Uxell, and I'm going to talk about a class of C2 interpolating splines that provide solutions to some important and long-standing problems of curves used in computer graphics and other fields. More specifically, all curves in this class have C2 continuity everywhere and local support, and they do not require solving a global numerical optimization problem. I'm also going to talk about some specific example curve types within this class, and they will show you how we can construct curves that guarantee self-intersection-free interpolation with well-defined bounds to the control polygon, and how we can form perfect circular arcs and elliptical arcs, and perfect lines. Well, apparently, lines can be tricky with C2 interpolating curves. Who'd have thought? Well, if you're not quite familiar with some of these terms, don't worry about it. I'm actually going to do a brief overview before we continue. So let's talk about curves. Well, let me start by saying that I'm going to use the terms curve and spline interchangeably, so don't pay attention to which one I'm using. Well, curves can be defined in various ways, but they're typically defined by a number of control points. And broadly speaking, we can think about two different groups of curves. There are approximating curves that do not go through the control points, and there are interpolating curves that do go through the control points. And that's why we call those control points data points sometimes. Well, I'm a big fan of interpolating curves because you can precisely control exactly where the curve is going to go through. But strangely enough, approximating curves are actually more popular in computer graphics. And the reason is that interpolating curves can sometimes misbehave. And I'll tell you what I mean by that in a little bit. But probably the most popular curve formulation in computer graphics would be Bezier curves. A cubic Bezier, for example, is defined by four control points, and the curve interpolates the first and the last control points, and the other two control points just determine the shape of the curve. So if you want to have a longer curve like this with more details, you would just attach multiple pieces of Bezier curves. In fact, any piecewise polynomial curve can be converted into a corresponding Bezier form like this. So you could say, what's wrong with that? You can manually control the, the shape of the curve. The problem there is that you now have more control points to deal with than just your data points that the curve interpolates. But perhaps more importantly, if you want to get C2 continuity with these curves, that's going to be very, very, very difficult to do that manually. So what do I mean by C2 continuity? Let's talk about that. Well, let's start with C0. If the curve has C0 continuity, that means it's one big curve. It's not made out of separate pieces. If it has C1 continuity, that means its tangent is continuous as well. Actually, if you just look at the tangent direction, that would mean G1 continuity, that is geometric continuity. C1 implies parametric continuity, so it actually means that the length of the tangent, that is, the derivative of the curve, is continuous. In fact, C1 and G1 are very, very closely related. Given any G1 curve, Without changing its shape, you can convert it to a C1 curve if you just change how fast the parameter is moving along the curve. That is, you reparameterize the curve. For C2, we'll look at the second derivative. If the second derivative is continuous, it has C2 continuity. If just the direction of the second derivative is continuous, it has G2 continuity. Again, given any G2 curve, we can convert it to a C2 curve. And G2 implies that the curve has curvature continuity, and to be able to get curvature continuity, we must have G2 continuity. Another important property is local support. If the curve has local support, that means the shape of a curve piece is determined by the neighboring control points only. If it doesn't have local support, that means it has global support, so the change to any control points would change the shape of the entire curve, which is, of course, undesirable. There's also the concept of bounds, that is, the distance of a curve piece between two control points to the line that connects the two control points. If it's unbounded, the curve can be arbitrarily far from the line, depending on where the other control points are. If there's an upper bound to that distance, based on the distance between the two control points, regardless of where the other control points are, I'll call it bounded, which is another desirable property. Looking at the problems of prior curve formulations, the most important ones, in my view, are the potential self-intersections between consecutive control points and the unbounded distances to the control polygon. These two problems alone would make you want to use approximating curves instead. In my prior work on this, with Scott Schaefer and John Kaiser, we have shown that Kalmaran curves with only centripetal parametrization can guarantee that the curve would not form self-intersections and would be bounded. However, this only applies to C1 curves, 
For C2 cotton rom carriers, centripetal polymerization can help, but does not provide any guarantees. The recent Kappa curves formulation produces curves that are self-intersection free and bounded. Well, it's not C2, but it is G2, except for inflation points. However, it requires solving a global numerical optimization problem, which is fast if you have a single curve, but becomes impractical when you have a lot of curves like a yarn or a fiber level cloth or a hair model. Of course, global optimization means no local support. Though in practice, the impact of a control point tends to be more local with kappa curves. Forming perfect circular in elliptical arcs is not possible with polynomial formulations. Rational polynomials can form circular in elliptical arcs, but by adding an extra control parameter, which is not very convenient in my view. Forming linear segments can be a problem. You think that would be easy, right? Turns out when you have a global numerical optimization, that can be a challenge. And finally, a lot of prior work on curves are limited to 2D only, and Kappa curves are no exception, and it's unclear if they can be extended to 3D. Alright, now I can tell you how we can solve all of these problems that plagued the interpolating curves for so long. For that, we will use a different mathematical construction for defining the curves, which forms a different class of curves. Actually, the formulation is quite simple. We'll make use of two separate functions. The first one is interpolation function, which defines a curve that goes through three consecutive control points. And there are various ways of picking an interpolation function, and, and we'll get to that. The other one is the blending function, that blends the two consecutive interpolation functions, forming a piece of the curve between two control points. As you see, with this construction, a curve piece is defined by only four control points, which gives us perfect local support. In fact, we can't expect doing anything better than this for C2 curves. Well, are these curves C2 though? Turns out they are, if you just carefully pick your blending function. We use trigonometric interpolation as the blending function in the paper, though other alternatives are possible. This blending function guarantees C2 continuity, regardless of what you pick as your interpolation function. The mathematical details are in the paper, but here's the intuition. Even though a curve piece is defined by two consecutive interpolation functions, the first and the second derivatives at a control point depends on only one of the interpolation functions. So if the interpolation function is C2 continuous, we get a C2 continuous curve. Turns out I'm not the first person to play with the idea of blending two functions to form a curve. The first instance that I'm aware of appears in a tech report from 1968 which talks about linearly blending two parabolas to form a curve. Of course, this doesn't lead to curves with any nice properties, but it's in the same spirit. Over the years, only a few researchers experimented with this idea. Actually, a couple of them use the same blending function that I'm using in the paper. Therefore, the curves they describe are within the class that I present. Unfortunately, though, they're not particularly good examples of this class, and I'll tell you more about that later. All right. Now we're ready to talk about interpolation functions. In the paper, I'm describing four example interpolation functions demonstrating the capabilities of this class. Probably the most familiar one is the quadratic Bezier interpolation function, and that's fairly easy to do. A quadratic Bezier is defined by three points. I'm going to put two of them to the first and the last control points, and as for the middle one, I'm going to pick a position such that the curve goes through the middle control point. Now there are infinitely many positions for the middle one, such that the curve goes through the middle control point, and we could just arbitrarily pick one, but that wouldn't give us curves with nice properties. Instead, we would pick a position such that the maximum curvature of the quadratic Bezier appears exactly on the middle control point. And that's not hard to do, we just need to solve a cubic equation, and there it is. And this provides some very nice properties that I described in the paper. First of all, the curve is bounded, such that the distance of a curve piece between two control points to the line that connects the control points cannot be longer than one-eighth of the distance between the two control points. So the curves are remarkably close to the control polygon. In addition, the tangent of the curve is always towards the next control point in both directions. This also ensures that the curve is contained between the two control points. And a curve piece cannot have self-intersections. Another interesting property is the curvature behavior. Remember that we picked the maximum curvature to be at the middle control point. 
But we are blending two interpolation functions, so the position of the maximum curvature moves a little bit. But it doesn't move too far, it remains around the control point, which might arguably make these curves relatively easy to control. However, because we are using a polynomial interpolation function, we cannot get perfect circular or elliptical arcs. Using rational Bezier's instead could rectify this, but that would also introduce an additional control parameter. So, can we do perfect circles? Well, this brings us to our circle interpolation function. Three points in space defines a unique circle, and we can use that circle as our interpolation function, and we have perfect circles. Well, the other properties of the curves formed by this interpolation function are not all that great. The curves are not bounded at all, and they can easily go to infinity, and they can form self-intersecting curve pieces. So, not so great. Incidentally, though, these curves are identical to the curve formulations proposed by two separate groups independently. Unfortunately, these are not the best examples of this class. But we can do better using an elliptical interpolation function. Now, three points in space do not uniquely define an ellipse, so we introduce some additional constraints here by placing two of the control points along the primary axes of the ellipse. So please see the paper for details. Curves with the elliptical interpolation function can form perfect circles and ellipses, but the control points need to be carefully placed. This is unlike the circle interpolation function where we get perfect circles whenever four consecutive control points are on the same circle. On the other hand, most other properties of the curves formed by the elliptical interpolation function are far superior. The curves are bounded by the 21% of the distance between the two control points. They cannot form self-intersecting pieces, the tangents are always towards the next control point, and the curve pieces are contained within the region between the two control points. However, they have one rather undesirable feature, that is, they can form sharp curvature spikes near the centers of the curve pieces. Well, these are not as bad as having self-intersections or anything, but they're still bad because they form visually recognizable features that don't actually exist in the given control point data. This brings us to our hybrid circular elliptical interpolation function. The hybrid interpolation function combines the benefits of circular and elliptical interpolation functions and avoids their undesirable properties. Now here's how the hybrid interpolation function works. Consider the three points forming a circle here. If the angle of the larger circular arc here is exactly pi over 2, then both circular and elliptical interpolation functions would produce the same results. This is great, because if it is larger, then the circular interpolation function can start doing things that we don't like, such as being unbounded. So we switch to elliptical interpolation function. If it is smaller, this time circular interpolation function has no problems, but the elliptical interpolation function can form these undesirable uh, curvature spikes. So we use the circular interpolation function. By dynamically switching between the two interpolation functions, we combine their benefits and avoid their problems. More specifically, the hybrid interpolation function has the same 21% bound. It cannot produce self-intersecting pieces, the tangents are always towards the next control point, the curve remains between the two control points, and it can easily produce circular arcs. As for the curvature behavior, the local curvature maxima tends to be near the control points, which is good. Alright, let's see some examples and comparisons. Here are some simple curves generated with different interpolation functions using the same control points. Notice that all of them, except for the circular one, do a reasonable job here. Notice that the curve with the hybrid interpolation function changes color based on which interpolation function is active. Here's a bit more complex example generated using the hybrid interpolation function. As you can see by the amount of red color here, the circular interpolation function is favored in most places. If we compare this to the curves generated by the elliptical interpolation function, we can see some undesirable curvature peaks forming relatively sharp bending in some places, where the hybrid interpolation function has no such features, favoring the circular interpolation function. On the other hand, if we just use the circular interpolation function, they can deviate from the control points a little bit, forming a different type of undesirable features. The Bezier interpolation function does a very good job, except that it doesn't form any circular features. Well, let's look into that a little bit. Let's see what happens when all control points are on a circle. 
with four or eight control points, as you can see, the Bezier interpolation function does not really form a close approximation to a circle. In fact, forming a close approximation to a circle would require many more control points. Well, the elliptical interpolation function can form circles only in special cases. With strategically placed four control points, we can get a perfect circle. But when we add more control points, we start getting these strange curvature spikes away from the control points. Using the circle interpolation function, of course we get a circle whatever we do, even when the control points are irregularly placed. The hybrid interpolation function preserves much of the same behavior, forming circles whenever they are reasonable. As I mentioned earlier, there are a few prior curve formulations that actually fall into the class of curves I'm describing in the paper. Here's an example using rational Bezier's as the interpolation function, and there's nothing inherently wrong about using rational Bezier's, and in fact, it might even be a good idea. And the problem here, and the reason why we're getting these self-intersecting pieces and deviations from the control polygon, is that these curves are not actually carefully constructed. Doing what we did with our Bezier interpolation function, by placing the middle control point at the maximum curvature position, would probably fix all of these problems. Now here's a comparison to the recent Kamakura's formulation. The relatively sharp looking features here may be undesirable, but there's nothing technically wrong with them. The more worrisome part are the parts that are supposed to be straight, but kappa curves bend them so as to get curvature maxima at the control points. In our case, straight lines are no problem with any of our interpolation functions. It must be noted though, it is possible to come up with some interpolation function that would struggle with straight lines, so this is not an inherent property of this class of curves. In addition, couple curves are 2D only, but the curves in our class can be 3D and higher dimensions. Well, I promised you 3D curves, and here they are. In this case, both the hair mesh and the final hair model use our curves with the hybrid interpolation function. Well, I'm not going to try to do a live demo here, because this is not live, <laughs> so, but if you'd like to play with these curves, you can totally do so. Just go to this link and click on Demo. This demo uses JavaScript and WebGL, so it should work on any modern browser on any operating system. It also includes a source code if you'd like to see it, and all of the 2D examples in the paper. In conclusion, I presented a class of curves and some example curve types within this class, providing solutions to some important and long-standing problems of interpolating curves. More specifically, all curves in this class have local support and C2 continuity everywhere, and this, their formulation is rather simple and does not require any global numerical optimization process. The specific examples in this class show how we can get self-intersection-free interpolation, well-defined bounds, perfect lines, and perfect circular arcs. Of all the curve types that I know of, if you are interested in C2 continuity and interpolating curves, the curves I've described using the hybrid interpolation function is what I would recommend. If you're not interested in C2 continuity or interpolating curves, well, <laughs> thank you for watching this anyway, but I'll say that there are other curve formulations that might be more attractive. For example, at the High Performance Graphics Conference this year, we've shown that we can get C1 curves in 3D, using only quadratic polynomials as opposed to cubics, and get some performance boost with hair rendering. I think there's a lot of potential for future work about the class of curves I presented in this paper. Yes, the hybrid interpolation function looks pretty good, but maybe a particular application would favor a different interpolation function. One example I can think of is helices. None of the interpolation functions I described would form perfect helices, but it is possible to uniquely define a helix using three points in space, so why not? Well, the way I'd like to think about these curves is that they can be easily customized depending on the problem at hand. Just pick the interpolation function that suits your problem. And if you don't know what to pick, just go with the hybrid interpolation function I talked about. That's, that's pretty good. With that, I'd like to thank Scott Schaefer for his support and feedback, Jipei Yan for the Kappa Curves implementation, Zoom Excel for the wonderful artwork she prepared using these curves, Lee Perry Smith for the character and the hair mesh model, and the anonymous reviewers for their helpful comments, and particularly for pointing out some of the similar prior work. And thank you for watching.